If you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Acts chapter 5. While you're turning, I want to... Um, I believe I've told y'all before that when I was in seminary, I uh, dabbled, I guess would be the word, in Amway. It was called um, I think it was a Quick Star back then because they had an online, but it was basically Amway with a new name on it. And uh, the Amway had a culture, and every group you are a part of has a culture and, and what you're to behave. And you learn the culture by being a part of something. If you want to look the part, you begin to look like the culture. Every time you'd go to a meeting, the, all the speakers would have a suit and tie on, and, and their hair was combed perfectly, and their teeth were super white because they were using the Amway products. And they always, the, the Amway, I don't know if you know the concept of Amway, but basically you have products, and it's anything, it's, it's basically any kind, type of product. You can buy your cleaning supplies from Amway. You can buy your, your uh, you know, uh, personal upkeep uh, product, your deodorant, your colognes, your shaving cream, your razors from Amway or one of their affiliate companies. And so you start buying all your stuff from Amway and then you tell your friends, hey, y'all start buying from Amway too. And then you make a little money off of what they purchase and you're supposed to get a little bit extra as you purchase. And the guy then uh, up, up the line from you, he gets money when you purchase stuff. So if you get more people to buy the product, then you get a little more money. If they get people to buy products, then, then they get money, then you get money, and the guy above you gets money. That's kind of how it works. So you're supposed to buy everything you want from Amway, and so they would always have their Amway products on, and, and uh, you know, each and every time you'd meet, they would have the, the new guys, they'd run down the line and say, what is it you most desire? What is it you want out of life? And, and you know, the people say, I want a, I want a mansion. They say, what kind of car do you want? And people say, I want a, a Lamborghini. I want a Mercedes. Well, I don't you know, I don't know cars. I just drive, and, you know, I've got a little bug right now, so, you know, I'm, I'm okay with that anyway. But uh, they got to me, like, what would you like? And I'm like, I don't know, I, uh, Mini Cooper? He's like, yeah, that's a fun car. What would you like, sir? You know, that wasn't the appropriate answer. That was not the high-dollar car. That was skipped over that real quick. And, and there was a response that you were supposed to give. If somebody said, you know, if somebody said, well, what does the cologne smell like? They would say, it smells like money. That's what the answer was. Because you buy it for yourself, you're supposed to make more money. And you learn these little catchphrases. You learn these little attitudes. You learn when you come to this meeting, you're supposed to look sharp. You learn that you're supposed to listen to the tapes that they make you buy so that you can learn what their other people say. And, and you start to, you all start to smell the same because you're all wearing the same product. And you, um, you know, you, you, you homogenize into this group of people. All culture has that. They had their little catchphrases. Churches have their little catchphrases, you know. We have a whole room, instead of calling it a meeting place, we call it a fellowship hall. We don't call the things that, that we sit on, these aren't, these aren't benches, what are they? They're pews. Because if we're outside, we'd say that's a bench. In here, it's a pew. You know, we have these little slangs. Christian has these slangs and these phrases, and different churches have different cultures. In our church, we're pretty, we're pretty um, reserved when we worship. We don't do a lot of hand raising. We don't do a lot of clapping, a lot of shouting. That's not us. But you go to another church, if you're, not, if you're not clapping and stomping and raising your hands, then people say, they're just not into worship. You know, different churches have different cultures. We have Oakdale time. That's part of our culture. It means if something's supposed to start at 945, it starts about 10. That's kind of how, that's Oakdale time. We all have these things. Every, every organization is going to have the way you do things. So if someone was from another church and there were a, you know, a, a loud church where they raise their hands, they clap and everything. They'd come to our church and they might sit down and, and the choir starts singing and they might say, woo! And they look around and nobody else is going, woo! And so they don't do it. And then they come next Sunday and, and pastor something really great and they say, amen! And nobody else says amen. They might say, oh, okay, well, they don't do that here. And if they continue to stay in our fellowship in order to adapt to us, they're going to stop saying that probably. That's kind of how culture works. You want to fit in, you adapt to the culture that is around you. The early church had a culture also. Uh, we're going to be looking at that culture and talking about what happened in it. The early church, and this is last week we looked at what happened after uh, the uh, persecution began and the church began to disperse around the lands. Today we're looking at what happens just basically right after Pentecost. Right after Pentecost and people were being saved, they would meet together and get together. And, and while the, on the screen the passage is going to start in Acts chapter 5, if you have your Bibles, I actually want to read from you 
Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 32. It says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And this, and with great power, the apostles were giving their testimonies to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as there were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each of any who had need. And Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. The early church, the culture of, of, that, of those early believers was if there's someone who is in need, well, you know what? Here, borrow mine. Uh, you're you're, you're uh, having trouble. Your, your ox is sick. Your donkey is sick. Here, use mine and plow your fields. Go for it. You don't have anything to eat? Here's some food. I give you my food. It's not even my food. It's our food, and you can have some of it. There's people who are in even more need. You know what? I'm going to sell my house, and I'm going to give the money to the apostles, and they'll give it to people as they have need. And, and um, that was the culture that began to grow around these believers. They didn't see, they saw that they, they were all of one spirit, they are all of one accord, and, and they began to sell their houses and give it. And then you have Barnabas, who, who is, is singled out. Perhaps he's singled out because of his future involvement with the, with the gospel spreading, or perhaps he's singled out because apparently what he sold was just so amazing, this, this huge field he may have sold, and brought all this money and laid it down at the disciples' feet. This was part of their worship. This was part of their togetherness. This was part of the attitude that they had. And the early church, here, right after Pentecost, that's what it looked like. That was their culture. They weren't required to do that. The apostles never told them, all right, y'all want to join this, y'all want to join this group of believers? Accept Jesus Christ and sell your house. And then you can come and worship with us and, and study. It wasn't. Um, you want to be a Christian? Okay, give, give, make sure you share all your food with everybody else. You can't be here. It was never laid down as a requirement. It was what grew up as they worshiped together and lived amongst one another, and, and this Christianity began to grow and needed began to be a part of it. It was never a demand, but it was what they did in response to their forgiveness. And I think a lot of it was in part to the fact that they thought Jesus was going to come back any day. You know, if Jesus is coming back, why do we really need to worry about our houses? Let's, you know, why worry about the fields? We're not going to have time to harvest if Jesus is coming back. So I think part of it was the mentality they lived with, but part of it was just the joy that has, God had taken over. And we see this man named Barnabas who comes and sells it, and it's a great, it's a great thing, and he, he lays it at the apostles' feet, and surely they were all so happy that people were selling their houses and giving all the proceeds to the disciples so that it could be shared amongst the people. And it was just a great together kind of time. But then, a man, chapter 5, verse 1, named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back from yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we explore this passage in this sermon, I pray that you would remind us of what truthful lives to you look like, of what lives of, of honesty and not hypocrisy are we are to live. I pray you'll speak to us today. Change us if we need to change, to be a witness 
for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So again, we have, we have the culture. Sell, all, sell what you have and give it to the apostles and they can spread it out. And we're all of one of mind and one accord until Ananias. Now, the reason I say until Ananias, and I point this, but the sermon I, title I gave you is, is the first sin of the church, hypocrisy. A better title might be the first recorded sin of the church. We don't know what all was going on in the lives of those people. There may have been things. We're not saying that once they got saved, they were perfect. But this is the first recorded one. This is the first one that after the church is formed, we begin to see a, a conflict or an issue rising up in the church, or at least in the heart of two individuals of the church. Ananias and Sapphira, husband and wife, they see all this happening. They see the people coming and laying it at the disciples' feet, and probably there's great celebration when it happens and encouragement, and, and, and now they can meet the needs of the people around us. Now we can, the, the widows who are hurting, they can eat, and, and there's probably a lot of, of uh, congratulations and thanksgiving going on, and they wanted to be a part of that. They wanted to taste a little bit of that encouragement. They wanted to get a little bit of uh, pats on the back, and they wanted to say, we can do that too. So, he, with the knowledge of his wife, and it puts, the, it puts the onus on him because in that culture, he would have been the landowner. She probably wouldn't have been the landowner. And it was his decision, along with his wife, to do this. Husbands, I want to come back to that thought in a little bit um, with time, but I want you to think about the fact that Ananias, with the knowledge of his wife, did this and brought his wife into deceit with him. Husbands, spouses, husbands and wives, we influence our spouses. Husbands influence wives, wives influence husbands, you need to think about the way that you are influencing your spouse in your decisions because you are asking them to join you in life. And husbands and wives, you need to think about the way that you live in relationship to the person who is joined with you in marriage. That's a short thought on that, but let's continue. They decided to do this. You know what? We want to give. We want to give. But do we have to give all of it? Now, there's no command. Again, there's been no command. It was totally what the people were doing. But they said, let's sell this field. Let's sell it, and, and for such an amount. But let's keep a little bit for ourselves. We don't have to give them everything. We'll tell them we're giving everything, but we'll keep a little bit for ourselves. Okay, you good with that, Sapphire? I'm good with that, Ananias. Let's do that. So they decided they sold the field, and they brought it. And they laid it at the disciples' feet. And they were expecting probably celebration. All right, Ananias, good job. Now we can feed the widow and we can take care of the orphans and we can see the needs get met. That's not what happened. He comes, he brings his, his, his offering and lays it at the disciples' feet. And rather than encouragement and celebration for who Jesus is and how we're all together and how this is going to go really far, Peter says, Ananias, verse 3, why? Has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? There's a lot in that verse to talk about. First, Ananias and Sapphira probably didn't see this as some big temptation. They probably just saw it as, you know what, we can sell this, we can give a lot to the hurting, we can keep some for ourselves, and it won't matter all that much in the end. Peter says to them that the Satan has filled their hearts to lie to the Holy Spirit. So one, we see that this deception wasn't merely just a husband and wife trying to be frugal. It was an attempt from Satan to influence the people, to lie to the church, to be something that they weren't. And it was to lie to the Holy Spirit. This gives you also an understanding of Peter's concept of the Holy Spirit. He was lying to the Holy Spirit. You are lying to an individual. We don't say you don't lie to electricity. You don't lie to, to some force. You lie to other people. This is an understanding from Peter that the Holy Spirit is a person which, again, supports our concept of the Trinity. Again, another side note, but an important one. We're beginning to see the part of the theology of the other church that you could lie to the Holy Spirit. And think about when they heard this. Think about who these people are. Think about what they've seen. These people might have been, uh, they were probably at least, if not eyewitnesses, early hearers of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
they have either seen or heard about the way that the disciples began to speak in, in different languages at Pentecost. They had seen healings. They had seen miracles. They had seen signs and wonders. They had seen amazing things happening by the power of the Holy Spirit in the, in the ministry of the disciples, in the life of the early church. And Peter says, you are attempting to lie to the Holy Spirit. Well, they weren't thinking that. They were thinking, Peter won't know. Barnabas won't know. Nobody will know that this, that they weren't part of this transaction. They won't know what, the, what I sold the land for. They were just thinking they were going to slide it by everybody, and everybody was going to be happy. They weren't thinking they were going to try to lie to the Holy Spirit, but this is exactly what they were attempting to do. He says, uh, verse 4, While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? What he's saying here is this, Ananias, the land was yours. We never asked you to sell the land. It was in your possession. We didn't ask you to do anything with it. But you decided to sell it. You had the money. You could have come and said, here's part of the money that I got. I'm going to keep some of it for myself. Now again, that would have rubbed the culture a little bit because the culture was, you give it all to the disciples, but it was never a command. It was told, you know, the culture was that, you do this. But Peter never said, you had to give us everything you sold. It was yours before you sold it. It was yours after you sold it. Nobody told you what to do with it. So instead of giving some to the, to, the, to the church at large and keeping some for yourself, you decided to lie about it and try to give part of it. A lot of people want to talk about this passage as, as something about, about giving and the ways that we're to give and, and your, your tithe or your, your offerings. It's not about that. And it's also not about enjoying profit from what you buy and sell. Some people want to use this to say, see here it says if you sell something, you should give it all away. And they try to say this is, this is anti, you know, that the Bible teaches against capitalism. The Bible in this passage tries to support communism. It's not about any of that. It's not about any of that. Commune was the way the early church early on formed because they were living together and serving together and working together, but that was never the command to do that. And we have a man here who sells a bit of land and, and gives it to, you know, Barnabas gave it all to the church, and Ananias and Sapphira, they sell some. Peter says, you could have kept it for yourself. Nobody said don't keep it. It was yours before you sold it. It was yours after you sold it. The harm isn't in that they kept, they had the money. The harm is in the lie they tried to go about it. They said, he continues and says, after it was sold, it was not at your disposal. Why is it that you would have contrived this deed in your hearts. Now I want to look at two influences here. I want to be careful about it because a couple of verses over in verse 3 he says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie? And then he says here, why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? We have the spiritual influence of Satan trying to influence the early church towards hypocrisy, but Peter doesn't allow it to be totally the blame of the devil. He says, Satan has put this in your heart, but you have contrived it in your heart. Some of you are old enough to remember Flip Wilson's The Devil Maybe Do It. Anyone want to give an impression? You did? Go for it. Not me. Do you want to give one? Oh, no, Janie says no to that. You know, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. Anything bad happens, the devil made me do it. Peter doesn't allow for that. Peter doesn't allow for Satan to take all the credit for Ananias and Sapphira's deception. He says, you may have been, the devil may have put that, that, that seed in your heart, but you're the one that contemplated it and allowed it to grow. You're the one that thought about doing this and figure out how to do this and figure out what it would mean. We are to take responsibility for what we do. We don't get to blame other people or other influences. We decide we're responsible and, and we are the ones who have to make the decisions based on the influences we get. We don't get to blame it. We have to take ownership for it. And he put it squarely at Ananias and said, Why have you decided to do this? You have not lied to men, but to God. Ananias and Sapphira just thought that they were trying to pull one over on Peter and the disciples 
and have, have, a little, have a little celebration, have a little money in their pocket. But what Peter's saying is you have the audacity to think that you can come into this place and trick God. And we would think, how ludicrous. How silly. How crazy to think that Ananias could hide this lie, this hypocrisy from God. But then don't we try to do the same? Don't we try to come and meet the culture of this church and wear most of us business casual? Or, or at, least, at least fix our hair? And we come in and we sing our our hymns and our praise songs. We don't get too loud. Every once in a while, the pastor gets an amen. Thank you. Happens every once in a while. And don't we want to look nice and smile at each other? And don't we want to? Don't we want to give as the offering plate goes around? And you know, we try to come to Sunday school and be involved. Don't we all want to be a part of the culture? But then, don't there are other times where we're hiding deceit in our heart? or where our minds are filled with thoughts that have nothing godly about them. And the jokes that we tell are fun, but completely disrespectful. And don't we talk about love, and then look at some people and just think so poorly of them because of the culture that they're from, or the color of their skin, or the side of the tracks they live on. And don't sometimes we try to do a good deed not because it's good, but because we want to hear a attaboy. And we can fool each other. We can fool each other. I can come to church and I can preach a good message and then I could go home and be as mean to Katie. And Katie, because she's respectful and doesn't want to make a bad show, she might never say a word about it. And I could show up here, and I could grin, and I could talk about how good life is. And I could think I'm pulling one over on all of y'all, and I might be, but I would not be tricking God. I would not be deceiving the Holy Spirit, and you, in your lives, you can put on the nicest of clothes and fix your hair with the greatest of products, even Amway products if you want to, but when you, when you gather together and you fool everybody, you're not fooling God. God knows your heart. God knows your actions. He not only knows your actions, He knows your motivations. Your actions may be good. Your motivations for doing them might be terrible. And you might be able to come here and look nice on the outside, but inside you're full of anything but God. You don't know God. You've never accepted Jesus. You don't have it in you, but you like to come and look good with everybody else. You're not fooling God. See, Peter puts the onus of this this on Satan because Satan's attack of the church, we could consider this Satan's first attack to the church. What is the first thing Satan tries to do in this growing community? Introduce lying, deception, and hypocrisy to Ananias and Sapphira. Later on, he tries the attack from on the outside with persecution. His first attack is to put deception right smack dab in the middle of the church. Jesus preached time and time again against hypocrisy to the Pharisees. He said the Pharisees were like whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside, but inside there is rot and decay. You're like a bowl that you've wiped on the inside, on the outside, but the inside's full of dried up food. You're like, you're like, you're, you're empty. You, you, think, you, you pay tithes. You'll even give a tenth of your spice rack, but you don't think about justice, mercy, love. Some of his greatest attacks, for, for lack of a better word, was against the hypocrisy of the Pharisees who looked one way on the outside and their hearts were full of hatred and evil. And then here in this new church where everyone's having together and everyone's selling the first thing, the first evil that rises its head up towards the attention of the disciples is lying, 
deception, not doing what you say you're doing, not being who you say you're being. And Peter calls him out on it. And Ananias, verse 5, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. That means he died. And great fear came upon all who heard of it, you think? How's that for a church service? Woo! What's that? God works. Yeah, it does. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. We, they did not have embalming processes in these days. Whenever someone died, they had to take care of the remains promptly because of, of rigor mortis and, and rot taking hold. So they, they wrapped him up and they took him out and they buried him. After an interval of about three hours... His wife came in. Again, this is, this is scriptural um, support for services lasting at least three hours. Who's up for that? No? Okay. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter says to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately, she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband, and great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things done. That's a little extreme, isn't it? Come on. It's a little extreme. Peter didn't say, so you need to go repent. He didn't say, either keep it or, or give it. Don't lie to us about it. He said this, and Ananias drops dead. Sapphira comes in three hours later, does the same thing. She drops down dead, and fear falls upon the church and anybody who heard about it. Jesus took hypocrisy seriously. Jesus wanted us to live who we are in him, not try to fake it till you make it, not try to, to look like all Christian, but let your heart be different. He wanted it to be real and wants to live with that reality, not be something we aren't, not be whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. Jesus spoke about it seriously, and then this attack comes into the church, and it is dealt with severely as a show to the church that this kind of hypocrisy is not to be tolerated in our midst. Now, again, I said last week, I'll say it again. Acts is a transitional time in the life of the church. Things happen in Acts that are not the norm. Things happen in the book of Acts that were for that period of the early life of the church. They do not continue you want to you want to you want to test that tell somebody a lie and see if you die okay and if you don't i think you can you can affirm what i just said but it was a serious teaching moment for the church god does not want hypocrisy to creep in among us he doesn't want us to tolerate people who look one way on sunday and live a life opposed from god all the rest of the time he doesn't want us to be happy if you give if you give but your life is full of hatred he doesn't want us to be excited because if you if you teach well but your your the things you say out of your mouth the rest of the time are awful that's not what it's supposed to be and to prove this point so mightily both these individuals are dead now we could debate for a long time whether it was by peter's authority by their fear and shock of the moment, or by God's, God's omnipotent hand, what happened here. We don't have to get into the mechanics of it. We see what happened. And what's an amazing thing is because of this, I just want to read a few more verses. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest there joined them. That's like they weren't going to get close to the disciples because the disciples might know something about them. They don't want them to know. But... The people held them in high esteem, and more than ever, believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women. 
Ananias and Sapphira are struck down dead, and rather than turn people away, more and more people were coming to know the Lord because they were taking this seriously. If somebody heard that somebody came down and gave an offering, gave a special offering, and I said something to them and they, struck, they dropped down dead, do you think we'd have more people flocking here in the next couple of Sundays? Well, maybe to see what would happen. Maybe they could see somebody else come, come down front. But they ain't about to come down front. You know, maybe there'd be some interest. You know, we all like to see, a, you know, see something like that happen, but, but to be a part of it. But what they saw was that the people were taking this seriously, and they knew that this relationship with God was meaningful. We need to get to that point as a church where what we do, the God we serve, the life we live is intentional and vital and important, and it actually changes the way we live. And if we are being deceptive, and if we are being hypocrites in our life, then that changes, and people can see the change. And someone hears you come to church, and then they see your lifestyle, they don't say, well, those two don't go together. They say, oh, I can see that. They took it seriously, and they lived for God, and they loved Christ, and they loved one another, and more and more people were drawn to the Savior. We need our churches as people who are living towards this end. Church gets a bad rap for hypocrisy. One of the biggest complaints about churches is that they're full of hypocrites. I was, I was looking at a church sign, and one church sign said, um, you may, this church is not full of hypocrites. There's always room for more. So, saying, you're welcome because you're probably a hypocrite too. We get a lot of, we get a lot of slack for it because, because we say one thing, we do something else. We say we love people, and then, then it seems we exclude people. We say we, we want to help people, and then we don't seem to be helping people. But again, we're human. We're, we're, we are not ever going to be perfect. And I think that's one thing we need to understand, but we also need the world to understand we're still people. But there, there shouldn't be blatant. I mean, there's, there's one thing to be imperfect, but there's another thing to be blatantly hypocritical. And our churches need, don't need to be filled with people who are looking one way on Sunday and morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and living a life apart from God the rest of the week. You are the church in this building and outside of this building. You are the church on Sunday morning. You are the church on Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, Friday morning, Friday night, Saturday morning. You're the church. And your life is to be an example at all those times. And if you begin to take this seriously, if we all begin to take this seriously, not just trying to fit in with the culture that we have, but being fully-fledged followers of Jesus Christ, and we are going to see more people coming to know him as Savior because they're going to see the reality of it lived. It's not a game. It's not a, it's not a club. It's not merely a gathering. It is your life. What it means to be a believer. And we may look different than the early church, but that does not mean that God does not take sin as seriously, hypocrisy as seriously as he did then. You're not fooling, you're, you may be fooling us, but you are not fooling God. And you need to turn to him and repent. You need to live a life worthy of the name Christian. Worthy of the sacrifice that you have been a benefit of. Jesus Christ died on the cross to free you from those things. You are called a believer in his name. And you need to live that life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you now. I pray that you might speak to us and show us areas in our lives where we are, we are hypocritical. We say one thing, we do something else. We say we believe in you, but our life tells a different story. God, forgive us. Forgive us when we tolerate that kind of behavior in ourselves. Forgive us for not encouraging others who are living that way. 
changed. Brothers and sisters, I don't, I'm not, in, in the fullness of God's word, and my understanding of it, I don't expect perfection. I expect us to strive to become more and more like Christ. And this process won't even be, will never be completed this side of eternity, but it's a journey we need to go on. Let us not be comfortable in our blatant hypocrisy. Let us strive to be people who honor you. And thank you, God, you give us the opportunity to repent. Let us take seriously the warning of Ananias and Sapphira and let us repent of ever thinking that we were hiding anything from you. In Jesus' name we pray.